this, this is a day that we have much going on. We know that with this liturgy, uh, at the end of it, we had an artoclesia for the members of our philoptikos. We had a memorial service for a number of people, plus the departed presidents of our philoptikos. We have a pancake breakfast, and of course, we have a general meeting of the parish. Much is going on. But there are a number of things that our attention must be directed to. So of course, I don't like to be the ba bearer of bad news, but I have to mention to you today that this, of course, is the 13th of November. Uh, the season of Advent, the Nativity Fast, begins in two days. You know that when we talk about the Nativity Fast, we have a 40-day period that prepares us for the Nativity of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. 40 days of preparation. So whenever I mention a fasting season, I know I have the same reaction, what I can't eat. So I must say that for any fasting season, you've heard me say it before, you'll hear me say it again, the least important aspect is what goes into our mouth. Uh, but rather, we need to take the time to work on our relationship with God. This is a time that we need to take time. I'm not telling you not to go to holiday parties. I'm not telling you to do how, don't skip the holiday shopping. But what I am telling you is you have to make the time to focus on that relationship with God. And of course, that means that there has to be time for prayer. There has to be time for a focus on scripture. There has to be a focus on the sacraments. There has to be a focus on charitable work. There indeed needs to be time to focus on that relationship. So you should begin by setting aside some time every day that you can focus on your relationship with God, be it in prayer, be it in learning more about him through reading, attending classes. That is what you need to do during these 40 days as we prepare for God's greatest gift, the birth of his only begotten son who comes to save us. Well, we know that this is a very important occasion in the life of the church. We deal with St. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople. You know, he actually died on September 14th, the Feast of the Elevation of the Holy Cross, and this commemoration is transferred to this day so that it might be observed more solemnly. We look at a man born in Antioch in the year 345, one who dies in exile from his see of Constantinople in Comana in the year 407. But between those years, 62 years, this man really shows us much to offer, gives us an example, and gives us charges that we might indeed change our lives. Uh, we know that every Sunday, most of the Sundays of the year, other than 10 times, the liturgy we celebrate is that of St. John Chrysostom. Now, St. John Chrysostom didn't write every jot and tittle from blessed is the kingdom to the final amen, but what he wrote are the prayers at the very heart of the liturgy, the anaphora, the lifting up, the prayers that focus on the consecration, the bread and wine, and indeed focus on Holy Communion. He is with us. Every time we celebrate this, we have to remember that he wrote them during the time he was patriarch in Constantinople. But before that, he has much to show us too. He was born into a pious family in the city of, uh, city of Antioch. Uh, his father died very young and his mother, mother Anthusa, devoted herself to her son, made sure that he was educated. She gave the example of her belief in Christ and the way she lived. He had the finest teachers. He was the most outstanding student in rhetoric, the most outstanding student in knowing the classics. He indeed knew the Greek philosophers. He was one that his professors wanted to succeed them. That was not what he did. When he was 18 years old, he devoted himself to Christ. He was baptized, the custom of the time as people were baptized primarily as adults. He made the decision, was baptized. And for the next seven years, he lived in extreme asceticism in his home with his mother. He practiced prayer, fasting, focused on scripture, indeed disciplined himself that he might know his savior more. When his mother died, when he was 25 years old, he spent three years in a monastery outside of the city of Antioch, and during that time, 
his spiritual life deepened and grew. One of the things he did, which is very important, which we might remember during this season of Advent, is he focused on scripture. He focused on it, read it, studied it, absorbed it, digested it. He became an expert on the scriptures, both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. He indeed learned them. He wore himself out in prayer and fasting to the point where he was ill. He returned to Antioch when he was 28 years old. And at that point, uh, the bishop wanted to ordain him. He fled and delayed that as long as possible. But eventually, in the year 381, he was ordained as a deacon. And five years later, in 386, he was ordained to the priesthood. He was maybe sort of a traveling priest throughout the parishes. He was famous for his preaching and his teaching based on scripture. He could talk about a passage of scripture and give multiple sermons on it, reflecting themes that were important for our lives as Christians. Beloved of the people. Beloved of the people, he was in the city of Antioch for 12 years, and then in the year 398, the Archbishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch, died. The Emperor began to search for a new Patriarch to fill that sea, and his choice fell upon John. John Chrysostom, John the Golden Mouth, John the most profound preacher of his time. He brought him to the city, and indeed have, he had him consecrated a bishop, and then installed in the city as its patriarch, as the patriarch of Constantinople. He aroused much jealousy among other bishops who wanted that power and that see. John did not see the see and the work of a bishop as something which was power, but rather it was service. He became a profound preacher in the city of Constantinople, traveled to even the smallest communities, and gave witness to Christ, preached in such a profound way that he moved the hearts of many. Beloved of his flock, he focused on worship. That's how the anaphora developed for the liturgy. He called all to repentance and a life in Christ. One of the people who was highly offended by his calls was the Empress Evdoxia. She indeed led an immoral life, and he called her to repentance. Well, as a result, in the year 403, when he was just patriarch for five years, she had him condemned, defrocked, and exiled. He indeed was exiled, but an earthquake occurred in Constantinople in the following year, and uh, she said, bring him back, bring him back, or worse disasters might befall us. We know that he was back, and it's just a year, basically, that he is serving, and once again, he aroused the wrath of the Empress. She had him barred from the churches on Great and Holy Saturday. At his time, baptisms were performed on the, what, the the first anastasis or resurrection service, he was sent into exile. We know that his exile goes farther to the city of Comana, far outside of the city of Constantinople in the Caucasus Mountains. There, exhausted, worn, and beaten down, he went to the church of the martyr basilicus and prayed. And during that prayer, the martyr appeared to him and said, rest. Tomorrow you will be with me. He died the next day. In 407, the relics were taken back to Constantinople 30 years later, and he was canonized. He is one of the most profound hierarchs of the church, an example for bishops that they are all called to follow, an eloquent, eloquent preacher. So when we look at him, there are several things that should stand out to us. One, of course, is his love for appreciation and proclamation of the gospel and the good news of Christ. That's something we should do too, all right? Not in the magnanimous way that he did it, but as something we're called to. Also, the idea of charity. When he was the Archbishop of Constantinople, he sold the objects of luxury, he sold gold, he sold precious things, and he gave them to the poor. He established hospitals, he established orphanages, and patronized schools. So maybe the idea of seeing his neighbor in pain and coming to their aid is very important. It fits in because the gospel we have 
today is of the Good Samaritan, a very important story. And we have the story of an upstanding member of society described as a young lawyer approaches the Lord Jesus Christ and says, what must I do to be saved? The Lord turned the question on him and said, what do the scriptures say? What does the law say? And he said, the young man answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord said, well said, do that and you will live. And then the lawyer wanted to make it easier on himself and said, who is my neighbor? We have indeed the story. The Lord said one of the Jews from Jerusalem was leaving the city of Jerusalem, going to Jericho, and on the road he was assailed by a robber, beaten, robbed, stripped, and left half dead. While he was laying there, two people passed by. One was a Levite, the priestly tribe of the Old Testament, and the other one was a priest of the temple, and they saw him, they went to the other side of the street and walked on. The person, the third person who passes him was a Samaritan. So, you know, we have kind of a mild rivalry between North Side and South Side in Chicago. This was not a mild rivalry. The Jews and the Samaritans literally hated each other. They saw, the Jews indeed saw that Samaritans worshipped a God they did not know, while the Jews worshipped a God who revealed himself to them. They worshipped in different locations. Uh, the Samaritans were kind of a mixture of a Jewish stock and Assyrians. They hated the Jewish population. The Jewish population hated them. What does the Samaritan do? He sees a man and he sees his suffering and pain, he immediately bends down, reaches out to him, he uses wine and oil. So wine and oil should be a sort of symbols. They're an astringent alcohol to clean a wound, and then the oil is a salve to cover the wounds. He takes him on his own uh, horse, takes him to an inn, cares for him for two days, and then looks at the innkeeper and says, Take care of this man. Whatever he needs, you provide. I will pay you upon my return. And the Lord looked at the attorney and said, which of these proved to be the neighbor of the man who was beaten? And he said, the one who stopped and cared. Do likewise. That's something we hear, do likewise, and maybe our eyes need to open too. So when we talk about helping those in need, recognizing those who need our presence, it is the neighbor. But the neighbor is not someone we choose, it's not a relative, it's anyone God puts in our path. That is our neighbor, and we're called to sort of come to their aid. St. John Chrysostom did it in the 4th and 5th century. We indeed are called to do it in the 21st century.